If I'm a plant manager, what is Industry 4.0 and why should I care? We've seen how transformative ability to use data to become innovative. If I'm a plant manager, in most cases you rely on data scientists to be able to provide value out of data. I share exactly the same experience as you. I call it the golden roof on a shack. So what ends up happening is people end up paying for a very specific use case to put the golden roof on to make it look like I've done something but it actually is on shaky foundation. It's not scalable, it is inefficient. I've got no knowledge whatsoever about data science. I need to be able to make sense of the data without having to bring in a data scientist. The unified namespace is not the silver bullet. At the end of the day, what you end up with after implementing the unified namespace, you've got a platform for continuous innovation with data. People look for a very specific POC. You can justify the spin, but there's no scalability beyond that. The enterprise uh, nature of the Hive MQ, MQTT broker, uh, with things like high availability, the scaling, automatic scaling, uh, automotive manufacturing, and also even just connected cars, where in most cases, the loss of a single data point is a huge deal. You'd want to be able to enable uh, citizen developers. If you need a data scientist for you to be able to implement those uh, ideas, there is, there is friction. Why that's important was fantastically exposed because the plant manager should be able to investigate himself. In this conversation I had with Kudzai Mada Teresa, we tried to focus on what it means to tra digitally transform a factory from a plant manager perspective. I find many conversations are either too deep in the details about digital transformation or really at a consulting block layer perspective which doesn't really translate into practical outcomes. But in this conversation we try to focus in, if you're a plant manager of a factory, what now, how do you go about digital transformation and why is it so important? One of the key outcomes that, that came out of the conversation is that if we don't define and get the data layer right within your factory, digital transformation and innovation becomes very difficult and many uh, factories focus on single specific outcomes without understanding the foundation uh, of a digitally transformed factory. It is a must watch for any plant manager. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, follow. Kudzai, thanks for, for joining me. It's a fantastic honor to have you on our podcast. I mean, I've been a, a, a huge fan of you for maybe two and a half years. And I think I bumped into you, was it at Hannah? At, at, SPS last year, I think. Yes, yes. Um, and I was like, yeah, hey, that's a familiar face. And I, I'm, I'm glad that we actually got to shake your hand and, 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 and meet you. So I think there's uh, two, two things that I found really interesting. Number one is we're from the same country. Uh, and I, I, I would, uh, you, you always try to look back and, at successful people from your country and you, you relate. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, and you're in a similar space to me in, in terms of manufacturing tech. Um, and you share a lot of knowledge. I've learned a lot from your videos. Um, and so maybe to kind of set the context of this podcast and what we're trying to achieve with the podcast is, is not to go too deep into the details, because I think your podcasts are really detailed and, and, and useful for somebody like me, but at the same time to not be at the surface level, I call it the consulting layer, right? That talks about stuff at block diagram level and theoretical things. But I think there's a need for the middle ground where you take practical knowledge from people that have you know, been on the ground, been there, done that, face the realistic challenges, you know, because there's a reality to all of the stuff that you talk about in block diagrams, um, and try and pitch a, a story to a plant manager. So a plant manager is on the ground running a production facility. They understand technology of their process in their factory, whether it be you know, a food and beverage or you know, a casting process but they also want to transform to this new kind of technology. So I'd like to frame today's conversation with that in mind. And so the first question I've got for you is, if I'm a plant manager, what is Industry 4.0 and why should I care? Okay, great, great question. And um, thank you so much uh, for, for, for the invitation to, to, to your podcast. I've, I've also kind of like really followed your, uh, uh, your company for some time. While whilst I was still in South Africa and even up to now, I still really enjoy some stuff that you put out there. So uh, the respect is mutual. Thank you. So well, to answer your question is, it's 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 mostly um all about 
how to 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 use data to become innovative that's kind of like really what the 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 companies or plant manager really needs to uh uh care about industry 4.0 so maybe to kind of like give uh, some perspective to this it's um uh, this is something that has been going on in the IT sector for 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 quite a while now right so if companies like uh, Amazon companies like uh, uh, Netflix this ability to to use data to become an innovative company so like for Amazon that would be something like um like recommendation engine something that we take for granted nowadays how can i use the data to better serve the customer and make that uh, um, uh, 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 interaction flawless or seamless, right? And yep. uh, it could be how to efficiently get a route to deliver a package faster. On Netflix, yep. it could be the same thing. So it's all these companies that have been doing this for a long time, and we've seen how transformative or how competitive it can make you as a company, that ability to use data to become innovative. That's really essentially what it is all about in the IT uh, economy. Everything else is commoditized, right? I mean, there's not so much as far as the, the ability to buy hardware or any tools that say Microsoft can do better than Amazon. That that's it's it's a it's it's become a commodity most of the stuff, but the difference yeah. is how to use that data to become an innovative company. That's essentially really what uh manufacturers or 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 plant managers really need to to understand because what I see in most cases is that inability to understand what I mean to your point why why should they really care about industry four point or why should they care about digital transformation so basically digital transformation is what I've been describing so far these companies using data to become uh, uh, innovative and industry four point is a set of circumstances that make that possible, right? The ability, uh, the different types of technology, IoT technologies, uh, the different uh, types of protocols, uh, being able to kind of like uh, uh, communicate between OT and IT, all these circumstances that today enable you to move data from point A to point B or make data available to a such and such an application, they give you the power to leverage that capability to be innovative using data. So in a plant manager or in a manufacturing setup, really, this could be how, for example, in a, uh, how efficiently can you use energy, right? So, I mean, for example, in Europe right now, energy consumption is a, is a big deal, right? It, it can yeah. literally break or make a company. You, being competitive depends on how efficient you are with your energy use. So yeah. without having that data or those insights, it would be difficult for you to kind of like really run your, your 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 plant efficiently it could be about how do you better understand the customer what are, how to better understand the quality that they expect from you and how to meet that all of that is kind of like a manufacturing version of what it has already done so why should plant managers care it would really uh, significantly transform how they're able to run a plant using all those ex examples that I've provided, being uh, energy efficient, high quality, and also as far as making sure that your equipment is always up and running, uh, eliminating all this downtime. These are the things that really uh, industry 4.0 enables and why I think uh, plant managers or manufacturers in, in, in general should care about it. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... I think that's a, an awesome description. So let, let me try and explain it back just to make sure that I, I understand uh, what you're saying. So in, in the world of manufacturing, our products are becoming commoditized, whether it be a chocolate or a, 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 a bottle of beer or a, an engine component that goes into a car. The actual product is beca becoming more and more commoditized. There's more and more people that can deliver the same kind of product. It really comes down to how efficiently you're able to deliver the product to your customer. Uh, and what you're saying is that using data to produce your product more efficiently, more effectively, make it maybe more customized uh, is what you're saying is digital transformation. Um, and if plant managers don't adopt some level of digital transformation, they stand to become 
uncompetitive, if I understand, if I've tried to summarize that correctly. A hundred percent. And, and, and to your point, the, the ability to customize, I mean, the whole premise of Industry 4.0, I mean, when it was really kind of like that uh, uh, term was coined, was based on this ability to really reduce everything down to the batch size of one, that yep. uh, load size of one, that the ability for me as a as consumer, if essentially what I really want to do is I don't want to, to I'm only buying a a car or I'm only buying something off the shelf because that's that's the only option I have. But if I had an option to really customize something down to the specs that I need, that would be an ideal uh, situation for me as a consumer. So the holy grail for Industry 4.0 is getting to that point where you're able to really customize a product for a specific customer. And it's difficult to achieve that using Industry 3.0 or like traditional technologies because everything is really built for mass production, but yeah. industry 4.0, it gives you that flexibility to be able to actually uh, deliver a highly customized solution without really compromising on efficiency, quality, all those things that you've not been able to achieve. So the, the, the holy grail really for industry 4.0 is getting to that uh, batch size of one. So 100% um, I agree what you said there. Yeah, that actually, because I'm obviously, uh, uh, very close to the automotive industry so i followed very closely 99% uh, of our customers are all automotive and i've obviously watched the journey of let's call it german oem manufacturers where their focus was you know obviously mass customization you can go onto a bmw website and customize an x5 to have a, a pink uh, a gear knob if that's what you like right um, and different wheels and you know instrument clusters and all those kinds of things and the way they achieved that was was having individual, individualized comp oh, different components on the production line. So as the car came through the production assembly process, you would you know, add on what could Zai ordered for that car. In contrast, if you look at Tesla, they, they seem to have uh, not gone away from that completely, but you can have a level of customiza physical customization. But generally speaking, the car is pretty standardized. And what they've done that's really interesting uh, is to customize it to Kudzai's requirements you can change the software in the car. So for example, park distance sensors are standard in the car. Whether you enable it or disable it is, is whether you've paid for it or not. But the production process, all cars get park distance sensors. So there's, um, I think, uh, to your point about batch size one, it comes down to combining your production process as well as redefining the product that you're producing um, that can maybe, maybe more software defined as obviously one of the terms that's gaining some traction now. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for that. So, so you hit on some buzzwords in your initial discussion, IoT, ITOT, um, and to be honest, my interactions with plant managers is that they really see that as buzzwords, you know? So maybe um, talk us through what is IoT from your perspective? Again, with my plant manager hat on, if you were to explain it to me as a, as a plant manager. Okay, perfect. So... IoT is really, uh, so basically, first of all, it's an uh, internet of things, uh, the, 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 um, the full term for IoT. And it's, it's mostly about this, uh, at a generic level, the ability to say for a long time, uh, interactions on the internet have been uh, about um, uh, human beings logging in to a website or uh, performing some certain action and communicating with another human being on the other end, right? And now because we've got things, right, which are able to connect themselves up to the internet and also communicate on their behalf, that's kind of like really where the term internet of things comes into play that now it's not only humans that are participating in the uh, uh, in, in the in the broader internet, uh, uh, network is now things, and if I'm correct, now there's more things co communicating on the internet more than human beings. So kind of like this is where this whole idea uh, started um, at a more general level, and it has been applied in some uh, sense in the commercial uh, sector. But in the industrial se sector, what that means is that this is an ability to move data 
across domains because as you would understand traditionally in the in 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 a, in a plant you had these segmented uh, areas for 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 data which is like you so you've got your ot data and then you've got your it uh, networks sorry to interrupt uh just talk a little bit about what is ot and what is it just to kind of uh have a level playing ground yeah 100 percent. so basically what you are saying is uh, op ot is basically operations uh technology so all of the systems um uh, that you use for like your plant operations so you've got your 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 your, 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 your SCADA systems, you've got your HMIs, you've got your PLCs, all these systems that you use for the actual uh, production operations, those technologies is what you'd consider your, your OT, operations technology. And then you've got IT, which are kind of like these business systems. So you've got your ERP, which is your enterprise resource planning, where you kind of like really do your your, your planning uh, of, of, of your production. And then you've got... Uh, recently cloud based systems that allow you to perform many uh, different uh, functions whether it is uh, uh, advanced analytics or a specific function uh, uh, um, that is not uh, that is tailored to your organization so these are it systems and then we've got ot systems that i've just described now these systems they really live in two separate world as it were for many different reasons for security reasons i mean if uh, 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 members of your audience understand the page view model how uh, uh, systems are traditionally organized within a plant where you've got different levels uh, where you've got your sensors level zero and stuff and then level one you've got your pills and devices so there's that that's the number one reason why really you had this separation and the other reason really was kind of like technically it's been really difficult to, to achieve because systems in the OT world, your devices, your HMIs, they talk totally different languages to the language that has been spoken in, in the IT world, right? The cloud and all that kind of stuff. So it's there's been many reasons why that separation has existed up until now. Now, this is where the idea of Internet of Things comes into play. It is a set of technologies and tools that enable you to kind of like bring those two worlds together. And what that does is that it, instead of really managing or operating these things in silos, now you've got this context around what is going on in IT and OT. So basically when we talk about OT, IT integration, is this idea that now data is no longer existing, well, at least there's the ability to Make sure that data doesn't exist in silos in specific systems because as you would understand even within the operations technology itself there is silos whereby if you've got a system uh or a, a group of system from from one vendor typically they wouldn't be able to exchange information with another vendor so within the ot network itself you still have this siloed uh, uh environments so uh internet of things encompasses uh, technologies that allow you, first of all, to kind of like democratize data first within the OT network, right? With things like uh, starting with uh, standards like OPC, for example, uh, OPC UA, where what you are saying is that uh, instead of having, say, a, a Beckhoff system or a Schneider or Siemens system using uh, a, a, a proprietary interface, to exchange information, uh, OPC UA kind of like wants to have a, a standardized way of exchanging information within the OT network, where it doesn't matter really if it's Schneider system, it's if it's a Siemens system, they're all able to communicate using uh, OPC UA information, right? So that's kind of like that democratization of data within the, um, the OT network. And this is really important for a plant manager because what that means is that you 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 it gives you the the freedom to use the best set of tools right because now the situation is that you you, you are only purchasing a piece of software because that's the software that works with a certain class of plcs it's not because it's the best software on the market right and yep. this kind of like really uh, limits you in how you can um, be efficient or innovative you're only circling with what's there because that's the only software that works with a certain 
set of PLCs. Now, with the idea of OPC UA is that kind of like opening that space up to say you could use a software from a different vendor communicating to a device from a different vendor. So now you've got the ability to select the best in-class tools for a specific job that you are doing. So that's kind of like really within the OT uh, network. Now, moving your data from OT to IT, where now you kind of like really wants to bring your enterprise, build a context around your entire enterprise. You've got another set of communication protocols or interfaces that allow you to uh, integrate data from OT into IT. This is where we talk about uh, protocols like MQTT that give you this, this um, ability to, to integrate data at scale, even across geographies. So the idea of Internet of Things when it comes to industry, this ability to be able to integrate data uh, first within the shop floor and also shop floor to IT. So uh, I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very, um, I've struggled to, to, to get the concept across um, to, to a broader audience that actually makes the decision at the end of the day. So maybe, again, let me try and summarize. So you have, uh, within a, a factory environment, you have uh, production systems, sections, and typically divided into the shop floor where you actually produce your things, and then you have the business layer where you, you purchase and you do your accounting and customer relations and all that kind of stuff. And what happens is you have these different systems, and what you're, what you're saying is that integration between IT and OT is really around the sharing of data between the systems um, more in a more, let's call it, democratic way. So you're not locked into one particular brand of, of software uh, because it's locked to one type of PLC and you're not locked into one type of ERP system uh, or solution for an ERP system. You kind of have a democratization of the data so that you can then connect different solutions, best-in-class solutions, to make use of the data. If I'm trying to summarize what you just said, right? A hundred percent. And maybe to, to go back to my uh, earlier analogy or comparison with the IT sector. So, for example, when Amazon is gathering data, well, like, actually, what makes it easy for Amazon to gather data is because it doesn't matter for, like, whether you're using a, 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 an iPhone, whether you are on a on a on a, a Windows PC, whether you are running your system maybe on a server in China or whatever whatever technology it is that you are using, IT has already established these standards of communication that make it not really uh, important, like not really of concern what what system or what 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 vendor is providing that system. So that ability allows them to collect data and be able to then use the data with as little friction as possible. So okay. when it comes to industrial IoT or industrial sector, this is where you've got a whole lot of friction because data exists in silos behind proprietary interfaces. So the first step is really to kind of like break those silos apart and make sure that data is democratically available to all the different systems that want to act on that data. So 100%. So, so you're saying that the IT sector has is a step ahead, well, uh, many steps ahead, and the OT or the shop floor side can take some lessons from that. A hundred percent, yeah. Well, IT is miles, is miles, miles ahead, and basically the, the the premise of digital transformation in manufacturing is to try and emulate that to get to that. Okay, I think that's a good summary. That's a um, a good point. So. I know that you've prepared a presentation around unified namespace, and I think our uh, our conversation was heading in that direction to uh, to this concept of democratization of data. Do you think it makes sense to jump into that now? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then we can um, maybe as you go through the presentation, if you don't mind, I'll I'll throw in some questions if I don't follow anything. Oh yeah, sure. That works much better. Now we're gonna go into the um, presentation about the unified namespace, uh, how it enables digital transformation in manufacturing. And this is kind of like uh, one of those, um, what you normally call uh, uh, a buzzword, right? And so maybe I'll kind of like set the context here 
uh, before I really dive into the uh, presentation, just to talk about why it is me, I'm kind of like uh, excited about the unified namespace, or I'm kind of like really advocating for um, the unified namespace. So, I mean, I, and it's not, so I, I'm developer advocate for HiveMQ, so I'm, I'm associated with HiveMQ, but you kind of like give you a, a sense of how how much I sort of like uh, believe in this kind of approach to data architecture in manufacturing. I've been, I I, I think I wrote my first article on uh, MQTT in uh, 2014-15, and wow. that is kind of like 10, almost a decade, and that was like seven years before I joined IBMQ. So for me, it was clear from the onset that this is kind of like really where uh, uh, things need to go. Like I, I had that conviction because I, I started out in the um, industrial system integration in, uh, in, 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 in South Africa, where I would go into, so previously I was in embedded systems design with some software development and stuff. And I would go, when, when I started going into factories, I, I, I was stunned. Like I was shocked at the level of the way things were still being manually uh, 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 performed or like having seen people walking around with pen and paper. And so I, at first, like for me, I thought maybe I was, being naive, right? This is basically how it needs to happen, right? So for some time, I kind of like really just uh, played along uh, until I got to really understand that, okay, manufacturers actually would would actually want to do it better, right? Given a chance. This is not, it's not, it's not because this is kind of like really how it needs to, uh, to happen. So that's why I started to kind of like go into the space to find out, okay, so now there's, there's value in really uh, automating this stuff as far as uh, data collection and insight is concerned. When I started to investigate more about um, data integration technologies, Internet of Things and all that kind of stuff, this is where I bumped into technologies like OPC UA. And OPC UA, it was already well known in the uh, in the industry, but to my surprise, I mean, even up to this day, OPC UA is still being used for data access, right? Whereas yeah. OPC UA has got this sophisticated information modeling capability, which I really find so compelling because it really allows you to describe uh, the complexity of an industrial setup. And that's why I really went went, went like um, onto some kind of a, a rabbit hole in, in really exploring this technology and 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 uh, exposing it same applies with MQTT. So I've been kind of like going through this for 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 a long time and trying to understand different architectures. Now I I I say that to mean that I've not come across anything that is close to what Unified Namespace uh, 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 advocates for. Hence my excitement about this. So and I really open to challenge. People just okay. If the unified namespace is kind of like really uh, not the right solution for you, what other architectural approach is there that that you know of that you think could be an alternative? Because all I know most is vertical integration using like vendor specific tools. So it could be whether it's local automation that is giving you this whole set of uh, suite of tools that keep you vertically integrated, or it could be Siemens. So there isn't really any other technology that advocates for like an open ecosystem out there as far as that is concerned. That is kind of like really why I'm, um, I'm sort of like uh, uh, interested on in the unified namespace. And if I come across a different architecture, I'll be really more than uh, uh, happy to, 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 to understand it and explore it. For, because for me, the mission is really about how to enable manufacturers to um, to use data to become innovative. That's kind of like really for me, what is uh, the mission? It's irrespective of uh, the technology that is being used there. So that's kind of like a, a, a background uh, to give you the reason why I, I'm, I'm making this presentation and I continuously uh, preach about uh, the unified namespace. Okay, so I mean, as we have kind of like really set the context here that the idea really here is about uh, using data to become uh, 
uh, an innovative company, right? And what what how you typically achieve that using a traditional uh, architecture is that you kind of like really follow the uh, the, the the ISA ninety five or Peugeot module, whereby you already have this uh, uh, segmentation uh, that has been created, whereby on your shop floor equipment typically co communicate to like your um, yeah, your, your scatter systems and you've got your scatter systems uh, communicating to MES, ERP and the cloud, right? So if you want to integrate data from like say PLCs into a scatter system, now you need like that point to point data integration, which in most cases already exists. And if you want to move your data from MES, from SCADA to MES system or MES to SCADA, there's another uh, point to point uh, integration, which for like, a lot of companies, at least to my experience, they still don't have that connection between MES and SCADA, right? It's a manual uh, entering of data, moving it between these two uh, types of systems, again, to ERP and cloud. So this is the kind of uh, integration that is currently, uh, or, or the set of technologies or tools right now allow you to, to sort of like uh, uh, integrate data across your uh, uh, your enterprise. So now I'll, I'll talk to you a bit later on about how that really uh, makes it complex or makes it difficult really for you to become an innovative company using your data. Now, this is also another example of a say, uh, how do you, because essentially data-driven uh, operation is, is about really addressing a set of uh, data use cases. So for example, if you say you've got a predictive analytics use case and You've got some a machine that you want to kind of like really uh, get data from to to perform your predictive analytics. So typically, what you do is you connect up to that machine. So like it's a point-to-point -point connection. Get that data out and uh, build your 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 predictive analytics application. And if you need to do for that that for this a different type of machine, you need to go through the same process. Connect to that machine contextualize the data, move it to predictive analytics. Now, as you can see, all of this is happening in silos. So again, you've got another use case that you're doing for OEE, you do the same thing and, and so on and so forth. So all of these use cases are being addressed uh, independently. So what that does eventually is that it really creates this spaghetti architecture where you've got different systems trying to collect data from many different systems using point to point uh, communication protocols. And then as you can already imagine, this really becomes a nightmare as far as um, um, managing the system, because first of all, you can't easily replace one part using another. So if you've got a software that is directly uh, connected to a PLC using a certain, certain set of uh, protocol drivers, it means you can't just remove that PLC and replace it with another. You need to write a new set of, of drivers for you to get data from uh, that PLC, right? So this is a whole lot of engineering effort just to get data out, right? So, and engineering effort really means cost. So a cost really means that it becomes difficult for companies to even really go through with it. So once you've set up that uh, communication between one predictive analytics app and then one machine or system, that's what you have. If you need to do another use case, if you need to address another use case, it means you need a different uh, 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 set of activities that need to go on for you to even get that data or information uh, out of it. So those are the challenges when we are talking about getting data or connecting systems together on the shop floor. Now, when we uh, are talking about enterprise wide um, uh, advanced data analytics because remember again this is all about data how to use data to really become an, an innovative um, uh, company and uh, going back to the conversation that I, 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 I highlighted earlier uh, at the beginning of the presentation that in most cases what you have today is a situation whereby you have got this vertical integration of data where if data moves from uh, a, a, a a PLC of such and such a vendor into a system of such and such a vendor. And then the idea is to eventually land that data into some data lake uh, 
uh, in the cloud, right? And yep. this is not only a, a problem of industrial uh, sector as it were, by the way, this is also a challenge even in the IT sector whereby data has been, uh, the approach to data analytics has been that you collect data from all these different business domains, you dump it into a data lake, and then from there, you bring in the data scientists, they go through the data, and then they start to address those use cases that you need for you to operate your business better, right? Yep. Now, this is a, a, a challenge. This is a very big challenge, both for the industrial sector and even for the IT sector. But for now, we're going to focus on the uh, industrial sector uh, for many reasons, right? Now, the number one reason, first of all, is... Uh, Again, the topic of the lack of that ability to uh, the seamless data integration, because if you are integrating data from, say, uh, uh, system A into system B, there's, in most cases, a uh, lack of context. You really need to transform that data to actually match the context of the uh, uh, destination uh, system. But currently, what is... The situation is that data is being moved without context into uh, a data lake or into another system. And when it comes to industrial IT, it's not even easy to get that data out. Again, going back to the, to the point that I raised that um, for you to be able to get data out of a, a certain system, you need to write a certain set of protocol drivers or you have to implement a certain piece of software for it to get that data out. That is a huge amount of friction just to get data out, which discourages uh, your ability to innovate or the rate at which you can innovate. Can you imagine if all every time you think about, say, because you're a plant manager there, and then you have all of a sudden uh, uh, realized that we could actually get some insights. If we can get data from this set of machines, we could get such and such an insight. And then fair enough, you've got this idea. Now you're moving into implementation. And then you discover that, oh, you need to bring in a, a software development team. You need to bring in an engineering team. You need to bring in SCADA engineers. You need to bring in MES engineers just to for you to test that hypothesis that you don't even know is going to work, right? Yeah. So it really becomes a, a, a roadblock for you, that lack of seamless data integration and the, the lack uh, of uh, seamless extraction of value. Yeah, I, just, so I want to emphasize that point. I think that's been my experience of the biggest resistance to adoption is because with existing uh, architectures and factories, just to get a simple PLC over the line is complex um, and costly. As you say, it takes time, which equals money, and then it's like a, a question of, is it worth it? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So uh, the second point is the, uh, the, the lack of scales, right? So. First of all, the kind of scale that we're talking about is um, how many. So if you are uh, reading data from, say, a, 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 an OPC server or OPC server um, with thousands of tags, and you've got multiple systems that need to, to, to get information from that, and they all need to connect directly to that specific data source. So if you've got like 100 applications, that need to connect to that one server for it to, for, for, for those applications to get information out of it. You can already see that this is something that is not going to scale easily because if I'm application A, I need those 500,000 tags. Application B does the same process to get 500,000 tags and so on and so on. Already you, you, you've got 100 PLCs replicating the same thing. So it's not a scalable uh, way of getting data out of this system for enterprise-wide integration. And if you think about the spaghetti architecture that I presented earlier, the more you add the systems up, even across different geographies, the more impossible it becomes for you to even really integrate and even manage these systems to know exactly if ever there's a, a fault or you need to change or whatever the case may be. So there's that scale of, 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 of volume and there's also really this, this, this scale of context, right? To say, these are not only just systems that um, are many, it's systems that are many at the same time, they've got widely different ways in which they understand data or they represent data. So there's the challenge of getting this, this data out. 
and this challenge of really understanding this data at scale. So this is also another problem that makes it very difficult for you to get um, uh, value from the traditional way of uh, data integration. And the third point is really kind of like what I've already spoken about is this idea that when we talk about uh, digital transformation, and I see that a lot with um, uh, companies because I'll be very honest, it's some, in most cases, it's really difficult to make this case for this uh, new way of doing things because you'll get, say, a plan manager who's going to say to you, but I, if you are talking about predictive analytics, I've got this app, I'm connected to my machines, I'm getting all of that data, I'm getting all of that, and I'm using OPC UA, I'm using Modbus, what, why do I need to change that to MQTT or why do I need to put a unified name? So they can't really get that because they're already getting value out of whatever it is yeah. that they've done. But what they in most cases fail to understand is a bigger picture to say, this is a project that maybe you are you're excited about and you're getting value out of maybe for say six months, right? And after that, what happens next? Now you're only solving one problem in your organization. Now you need to solve problem number two, which is actually the, in most cases the 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 the, the situation, right? Because we, yeah. you don't solve everything using just one solution. Now you need to solve problem number two. You need to solve problem number three. All these uh, use cases, and in this day and age, really, for you to remain competitive, you need to be able to respond rapidly to all these use cases, and not only for like uh, final implementation, but just the ability to test hypotheses, again, to my point, being able to just plug into a system, test a, a scenario, and then move ahead with it or not, just do a POC, whatever the case may be, it's, there's so much value in being able to do that, but you, you, you won't be able to respond rapidly to all these data-driven use cases because there's so much friction for you to getting that set up uh, 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 initially. So. These are the really the big challenges that make it difficult. And also I need to stress the point that in most cases, it, it is the lack of uh, having that data platform that allows you to be able to just kind of like get data that is readily available, which is kind of like really what I'm going to talk about um, uh, uh, in the next slide as we go into um, uh, the unified namespace topic. Yeah, because I just want to add to that. I, I, I share exactly the same experience as you. I call it the golden roof on a shack. So what happens is you have these factories that are, their foundation is built on shaky foundation. Uh, but the, the use case is a very specific one that somebody's willing to pay for. So what ends up happening is people end up paying for a very specific use case to put the golden roof on to make it look like I've done something, but it actually is on shaky foundation. And I think that's to your point, is that I think, uh, and I think the challenge is, and I've made numerous presentations on this, is that I think the foundation is not sexy enough for people to pay for. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is the foundation that, that nobody sees, that you can't you know, you know, tangibly explain the value to, but it, without the foundation, you won't transform your business you'll get many golden roofs and eventually you'll have many golden roofs and eventually the roof will be too heavy for your shack and eventually it'll fall down. Um, and so that's the analogy I tell a lot of people. The golden roof was, I, I was explaining this concept to one of our customers and he said, he came up, he came up with the, the golden roof analogy and I think it's, it's, it's exactly what you're saying is that the people look for a very specific POC to add that you, know, you can justify the spend but there's no scalability beyond that. 100%. It's, it's, it's a very, uh, very, very uh, correct um, uh, analogy, that uh, golden roof, right? So it's something that you can, it's easy for you to kind of like go to, to leadership and say, look, we've connected this up, we are getting all this information, but I mean, you don't really, the leadership that you know that there's no foundation to this. You can't build on top of that. You can't even use that uh, uh, in context with other applications that are running within your 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 your, your organization. So I really agree with that. Um, and, and the goal of the podcast is to address exactly that, is to create a level of uh, or the, the 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 way we should pitch this podcast and my hope podcast in the future is at that level of leadership that need to be explained to 
about the unified namespace as a foundation, uh, as an example. Yes, 100%. So yeah, I mean, this kind of like really uh, gets us to um, the unified namespace itself. So I've spoken about a whole lot of different uh, 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 challenges. So um, for example, I'll start with the challenge of being able to uh, uh, respond rapidly to, um, to data-driven use cases. And um, one of the big uh, challenges really, uh, or, or one of the reasons why that challenge uh, exist is that in most cases you rely on data scientists to uh, to be able to provide value out of data, and this is it's, it's not scalable, and it is inefficient um, because what typically you would want to be able to do in an organization is really uh, enable what we call uh, data um, uh, citizen developers, right? So if I'm a, a, a plant manager, I've got no knowledge whatsoever about data science. I need to be able to make sense of the data without having to bring in a data scientist, right? And yeah. that's really what to make uh, you innovative because the idea is in your brain you want you have got an idea of how you could actually understand how to perform better. Now, if you need a data scientist for you to be able to implement those uh, ideas, then there is there is, there is friction there. there. There is big amounts of friction, and you're not able to to do that. So the the idea is that every domain within your organization matters, and they understand the data better, right, than the data scientists themselves. So. The idea really here is to say, first of all, is kind of like uh, um, uh, decentralize the ownership of data. That is kind of like really a, a, a crucial aspect of the unified namespace to let the people who understand it better be the ones who actually uh, create or, or the analytical data, the kind of data that really gives them the power to analyze what is going on, say, in the shop floor, whatever the case may be. So I will kind of like really explain that more to say, if you are an automation engineer, so you kind of like, you really understand all, first of all, where to find the data, number one, you understand where to find the data. If you take that data, raw data as it is, and move it into a data lake, you hand it over to an IIT person who has no idea what this data point is or, or where this temperature data point is, is, is coming from a, a boiler or what. There's so much context that that uh, uh, data scientists or IT personnel does not have around the data. So the idea is to kind of like move ownership, data ownership to the edge of the network, to the domains, right? So if you say again, uh, the example of an automation engineer, they are the ones who understand where the data is. So they are the ones who need to, first of all, provide context to the data. They are the ones who need to say, okay, this is a model, this is a pump, this is a, 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 a current from a such and such a pump. And then they that data needs to happen within that domain. And then it is pushed into a common data infrastructure as a product. So it's now, Data is as a product. So this is a different way of thinking about data as a as a byproduct to say, because that's kind of like the 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 approach that we're still uh, getting right now to say we have we have got a production process here, and we happen to have data, and let's just collect that data and put it into some data lake or some store or some warehouse somewhere, right? So that the first part is to kind of like really change that mindset and look at data as a product, right? As a product that says, how how do you incentivize, same way as product management, how to incentivize people to use that data? How do you make it easy for people to interact with that data? And then that, that, that can only happen when that domain ownership is moved to that specific domain who understands, okay, for any data scientist or anyone who wants to, to go through this data, this is how best they will be able to interact with it because I know this temperature is related to that. I know I need to add context here that such and such 
cleaning was happening. There was cleaning or maintenance happening at such and such a time. I need to add that context, right? Because the data scientists would not know that this happened during maintenance routine or this happened. So giving that data ownership to those domains and also same thing going to business, giving the business that domain. And then all of that information, once it's been converted into analytical data, it is then pushed into a common data infrastructure. That then allows every other domain that is interested in that piece of information to consume data that has got meaning, to consume data that is already contextualized. And then you can then persist that into a historical database already as a normalized or contextualized data, right? But before you even persist it, already it gives you that ability to understand the state of your organization in real time. You already have analytical data in real time. You understand this is happening because of such and such and such, because you have kind of like pushed ownership to the edge, to, 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 to the domain, the people who understand the data better. And the idea of edge driven here, where we're saying, instead of having applications or systems from uh, the top floor being going down and calling data and, and, and trying to get information out of these systems, rather we have these systems push data from the edge whenever there's uh, uh, something uh, worthy of reporting, whether it is an event, whether it is a change of a parameter, whether whatever is happening. Now, you, when you do that, you are creating this uh, 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 semblance of uh, 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 a single source of truth, or you are creating this semblance of the current state and a snapshot of as things happen within your organization, they're being pushed into a common data infrastructure. So whoever is consuming that information understands that this is the current picture of what is going on, not only in the shop floor, but across my entire enterprise. So there's context and you can, it's easy to build, to build business models around that because you understand that whatever information I'm getting now is the current state of the business. So I can make decisions based off of that because I've got the context around what is going on across the entire enterprise. That's kind of like really the idea of, first of all, uh, domain ownership, and then the idea of having this being edge driven into uh, a data infrastructure. Now, uh, yes. Sorry, uh, carry on, Kudzai. I wanted to summarize my thoughts, but uh, if there was anything else on the slide, please continue. Oh yeah, sure. And then now what I've just described is, is nothing special, right? This can be achieved using even existing uh, uh, systems. Now, what is different with the unified names is, is that it advocates for an open architecture. Now, if you are going to do that, you need to use an open architecture. You need to use open and freely available uh, interfaces or standards, right? So that anyone who's got a PLC, they can just implement that specific standard, whether it's MQTT, and it will be able to consume information uh, easily or publish information easily in a way that is commonly understood across your entire enterprise. So whether it's uh, analytics applications that are in the cloud, they understand MQTT, whether it's PLCs that are using MQTT. So that, that is very important to have that open architecture that allows you uh, to plug in systems. So if you're gonna buy a PLC, you want to be able to just plug it into your network or data infrastructure, point it to a certain uh, endpoint, and then it just pushes that information out, right? That ability to be able to do that really allows you, again, going back to the point of just selecting best-in-class tools and then plugging them into a data infrastructure because you understand that almost every other system or every other component will understand the, the, the will be able to understand the message and interpret it because it's using the same set of open standards. And the last point here is the point of federated uh, 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 data governance to say, in as much as we spoke about this idea of pushing domain ownership to different uh, domains, controls, operations, business, applications, informations, we don't want, it's easy for that to turn into uh, like wild, wild west where everyone, people are just defining their own models or defining their, their, own, their own way of understanding data. So you are giving them that um, autonomy, but the idea of that. Federated data, data, data governance is to put guidelines of 
data modeling or representation of information across your entire enterprise. You're not just kind of like just letting people define things up however they imagine it, because again, it, it's going to defeat the purpose if, if it's only understood within that domain. You want it to be understood in control the same way it is understood in business domain. So the idea of federated governance is to put in those guidelines that say across our et entire enterprise, this is how a compressor should look like. This is basically yeah. what, what what we expect a compressor to look like. Across uh, our entire organization, this is how we expect a, 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 a job or an order to look like, right? So this idea of federated governance to put in those specification, your own uh, custom specification for your enterprise about how the interpretation of data should be done is another layer that you add on top of that ability uh, of um, decentralized uh, data ownership. Yeah. I think that's really, really an important one because, like you say, it can become the wild, wild west otherwise. Yeah. But, but let, me, let me just try and summarize that because there's some key things that, that are resonating with me. The first one was the domain ownership. So if I summarize, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is if you require a data analyst in your factory to go and investigate a particular thought process that a plant manager might have, then they've, logged, they've recorded the data incorrectly without context because the plant manager should be able to investigate himself, right? If, if, if I'm understanding the, the first part. The edge-driven is really around, uh, um, I think the common word is report by exception. So you are reporting up based on specific events. You're not, re you're not coming down to look for the event. So the, the, the system on the ground is sending up information as opposed to querying information from, from the top. Um, and as, as we said, federal, uh, federated data governance is setting the, the ground rules and principles on which uh, you will define objects in your, in your factory. So like you, you mentioned a compressor, this is what a compressor data looks like. It means temperature, current, time on, time off, whatever that looks like. So anyone looking at compressor data, whether it be maintenance or finance, uh, they understand that the rules, if you want, the guide rails of that data per object, if you want, if, I, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yes, 100%, 100%. And um, uh, just also to kind of add also on the issue, first of all, of age driven. So this idea that instead of systems coming down in the shop, another big advantage that kind of like really um, a lot of people miss is that if you are requesting data, when there is a network break, right? In most cases, that information is lost, right? That information is lost, but if it is edge driven, it, it, it allows you to buffer that information and then republish it when, 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 when the, uh, com the communication is reestablished or, or whatever the case may be. So that's yeah. another also advantage of, um, uh, of edge driven. And also on uh, uh, fed federated uh, governance, 100% I agree uh, with you there, just kind of like setting those um, uh, guidelines, those rules, um, but at the same time, giving that autonomy. Uh, for example, uh, say you have got a, a, a plant in India and then you've got another plant, say in South Africa, maybe there's a different set of problems in India that don't really apply to South Africa. That autonomy gives uh, them the ability to, to create models that are specific for solving problems at that Indian plant. They don't really necessarily apply in South Africa, so they don't really need to be uh, 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 governed centrally. They don't really need to be governed centrally. But if, say, uh, 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 that problem has been solved in India, and then it so happens to show up in South Africa at some point, or maybe the factory has evolved to now need to, ca to cater for that problem, it would be easy to go to India and say, okay, you've got this uh, uh, functional or, or, or modeling or whatever uh, procedure that you put in place to, uh, to, to, to sort of like address this specific problem. It would be easy for you to just take that and then apply it in, in, in the South African domain. So it gives you that autonomy to solve pro local problems but also it gives you that universal uh, 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 scale, as it were. Got it. Got it. Okay, so um, 
let's see. So again, this is kind of like really uh, not really uh, going much into detail with MQTT protocol because I recently also put out a, 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 a post on LinkedIn about why MQTT because in, in, most, in most cases, um, people will come back and say, but from what you are, and the way you are describing the unified name space, it's not, it's not a protocol, it's not, it's not something that is it's sort of like an abstract concept, right? This can be really be done using anything, right? So uh, in most cases, so this is the reason why I put out that post, I was kind of like trying to explain why MQTT is kind of like, in a way, becomes synonymous with the unified namespace, right? So MQTT basically is a communication uh, protocol or a mechanism of exchanging information uh, within different uh, systems by um, uh, creating a central server, which is called an MQTT broker that handles the coordination uh, uh, of information between separate uh, or different components. So it's different from like you say, uh, a request response whereby say if you're connecting to a PLC, you need to have a direct connection that points to a specific IP address that PLC uh, exposes and that points to a specific tag or object within that PLC, you need to address it uh, specifically, right? So there's this direct connection. So with the uh, uh, MQTT is built on the pub sub uh, mechanism of communication whereby an application doesn't really need to know uh, uh, the, the, the source, like detailed information about the source of that data. It just needs to point to the broker and say, okay, I'm interested in say the temperature of uh, compressor A. Well, I don't really care what PLC is running that compressor. I don't really care what protocol, but the PLC will know that I need to push temperature for compressor to the broker. Whoever is interested just needs to make the broker aware that I need temperature from such and such, such a, a compressor. But then again, obviously this requires that you already have a, a, a predetermined way in which you structure your your topics, right? So you understand because topic structuring, uh, so topics, a topic is basically, a, maybe I'll call it a tag in MQTT whereby you've got like uh, the name and then you've got the value. So it's like a hierarchical uh, uh, way of representing tags. So it's called a topic. So the key advantage of having that hierarchical is that it really allows you to represent the, the, the hierarchy uh, within the plant. So if you've got say plant A, within plant A, you've got such, such and such machines, within a machine, you've got such and such sensors. It really allows you to break down the source of the data in a way that it makes it easily discoverable within the broker, which kind of like really adds the next layer of on top of that to say, if you then go an extra mile and standardize the way you represent topics across your enterprise, typically using ISA 95, whereby you are the way your organization organization is already represented, it then yeah. allows give you that semantic, uh, uh, that power to semantically discover stuff because you already know how your organization is structured. You already know that I've got, in, in my organizations, I've got plant A, uh, and then within that plant, I know I've got such and such area. Within such and such an area, I know I've got this, and then you, it allows you to uh, semantically discover information or be able to explore these buckets of of, uh, of of data sources within your organization and get this information. So that's kind of like really why MQTT is become synonymous with Unified Namespace because it's got this tooling that allows you to explore data, that allows you to really explore this data. And also the fact that it's an open protocol, freely available, anyone can implement it. And we have seen, you know, the funny thing about open standards is that in most cases, big vendors, they're not really uh, so much enthusiastic about um, open standards because they're kind of like really, uh, in no a way, to be made. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and and the funny thing is that even in my interactions with um, some, some vendors who are now rapidly uh, uh, implementing MQTT in their uh, PLC systems, and, and recent, I know recently I had SAP is going to be also uh, implementing an MQTT connector, mostly it's because they I get when I speak to them, it's because they are getting uh, requests from customers, pressure from customers who are saying, 
we need this because customers are starting to understand the value of being able to have an open ecosystem where you can really purchase something, plug it into a network, replace it, and be able to interact with your data in a way that allows you to. So it's now, I would say, customers are becoming more and more informed by the day, right? And what is not at the level where I would say personally wish it to be the case, we still have a lot of customers who really don't understand that I or who don't really care, right? So a lot of customers, some of them don't really care whether there's interoperability. This is stuff that we get to geek about, right? But some customers they say, well, I don't, I don't care. I mean, if I just need to to produce stuff, right? I, whether this thing is a closed system, not inter as long as it gets product out of the door for me. But we're moving into a, a, a an age where customers are understanding that okay, we're actually living a lot on the table here by not implementing open standards. We could be so much uh, competitive. We could be so much uh, uh, better as far as efficiency is concerned. So that awareness is is, is slowly creeping in. And I, 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 I predict that now we're going to kind of like get an exponential, exponential um, uh, rate of adoption of these tools because it really it's it's, it's compelling the the the, yeah. the 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 ability to innovate that it allows you to do so so that's kind of like maybe going off tangent here on the mqtt protocol so so cuz i just wanted to maybe just get my thoughts around the topic explanation so let me try and explain it back to you so that, so that i understand it's it is a way to describe a data point with context so maybe if I give you an example. So we've got uh, Gendermark Global. We've got two factories, one in India, one in South Africa. So the hierarchy would be, uh, and, I, and I want to monitor the temperature of one of our CNC machines in South Africa. So I would have Gendermark, Gendermark South Africa, uh, machine shop, uh, machine, uh, CNC machine four, and then temperature sensor. So that naming hierarchy uh, is very important because when I log the temperature of that the, 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 the data point, that context of where it belongs makes sense. So when I start to add more data points of a machine in India and a different type of machine and uh, you know the different um, uh, you know, data points that we want to collect, I can have that hierarchy and context attached to the temperature, so that you know maybe initially it's about maintenance of the machine. But maybe one day finance might also need temperature across the, 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 the two factories we have to decide do we need to put air cons in, for example. Um, so if I'm, if I'm describing why the definition of the topic is so important and it's to give context to the whole, to the data point, right? It's not just logging temperature in some database. 100%. 100%. It really gives you context. And also to kind of like really expand more on that just to drive the point of um, uh, how customers are becoming more informed or, I mean, as I explained uh, initially that I've kind of like witnessed these uh, different phases where uh, of maturity as far as customers are concerned, where they really started worrying only about just getting data out. How do I get it data out? So you've got protocol drivers. The next stage is how do I move it from point A to point B? This is where MQTT comes into play. And then now we're at a stage where they're saying, okay, I can get data out, I can move it, I can do this, but how do I get value out of the data, right? So yeah. customers are maturing as we go about. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that if you, had, if you have uh, noticed around the uh, industrial IT community, there's now more the talk about graph uh, QL to say, okay, now we've got MQTT, it, 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 you, you are getting a data point with context, right? So you've got uh, uh, gender mark, gender mark South Africa, and then you've got your machines. But what if I need to say, find out uh, what is the relationship between uh, the machine in India and this machine in South Africa, right? So you might not get that in that MQTT topic uh, namespace because the MQTT topic namespace just gives you the hierarchy to say this machine belongs to this, to that, to that. But there's, if you want to be able to say, I want to find uh, uh, common uh, uh, relationships between all machines that were built by, say, such and such a vendor, and I want to find, uh, you know, just be able to 
have to to to, to sort of like uh, uh, understand relationships that are not necessarily hierarchical. That is why we've been getting conversation about now we need to in, include graph graph uh, 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 graphy QL into MQTT specification, which obviously is a is a controversial topic because now yeah. MQTT has really gotten to where it is because of its simplicity to really uh, move data, give it context, right? So this argument that this can be done on a on 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 another part of the on the tech stack, right? Maybe not necessarily on the specification itself because the the MQTT specification really gives you the ability to represent a unified namespace where just the ownership of the of 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 of, of the machine that context is enough for you to be able to understand your data but then if you need to go an extra mile you can then plug that into a graph db and then be able to kind of like get more value out of the data uh from using it. so this is kind of like just to explain how customers are becoming more mature and wanting yeah, to it's understand a, it's the more. right question to ask yeah. right so yes i've collected contextual data now i need to use it so but at least the 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 acceptance of collecting contextual data is becoming more common practice because now they're asking how do i use it how do i compare a temperature in india with the temperature in south africa exactly 100 percent okay so i've kind of really explained mqtt right so just for those maybe uh that have come across spark black so sometimes it might get confusing so it's because a lot of um uh, people think that maybe Spark Black is kind of like a, a new protocol. So this is slide just to explain that Spark Black is a, is a software specification. So basically, uh, what MQTT uh, does not do is that it, uh, it, it, it well it gives you the flexibility to define your your topic right the way that you want to add context to to a data point. So to your point. Uh, uh, gender mark, gender mark South Africa, and so on and so forth. Uh, but this is not a, this is not a standard way of representing it universally, right? This is specific to uh, to your company. So what Spark Plug does is kind of like define a consistent way of 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 of, of naming that hierarchy to say uh, th there is a group ID which kind of like represent a logical grouping of um, uh, of of, of uh, devices or machines that took MQTT, and then there is a, 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 a data type or sort of like type of of data that 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 is being carried by that message. So this could be uh, just a, a data type that is a, a piece of data that is announcing the metrics or the structure or the schema for you to prepare to receive that information or it could be the actual metric itself that you are receiving. So you need to know that needs to be represented within the topic namespace itself, right? So that's what Sparkplug also defines. It also defines the devices and so on and so forth. So Sparkplug kind of like defines how a topic should be uh, represented to address all those different common challenges that you come across as far as topic uh, namespace is concerned. And it's also, defines the state management of MQTT clients. So with uh, with flat MQTT or just your regular MQTT, um, if say a device disconnects uh, all of a sudden, there is no way of knowing, right? So M MQTT does specify the last will and testament, but it, not all uh, 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 applications or devices will implement that, right? So what Sparkplug does is that it, it kind of like, defines the state for MQTT client. So if an MQTT client joins, according to Sparkplug, it is requested that it must publish all of the metrics that it is going to be sending so that it notifies everyone within that not network that I'm, I'm, I'm such and such PLC, I'm located in South Africa, and I'm going to be giving you temperature and humidity. So all the PLCs, all the HMIs, all the SCADA, that are connected to that network, they already know, oh, a new PLC has joined, is going to be giving us temperature and humidity. So that is all automatic uh, data management discovery, which is a really powerful way of spark plug and that you don't find with uh, regular MQTT. And if a application disconnects from the network, it also needs to send again a message to announce that 
this such and such has disappeared. So whatever data you've got is stale. So don't really make any crucial decisions based off of that. So that is the state that Sparkplug gives to, 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 to MQTT. And again, the payload, because MQTT is basically a, a byte sequence. So it's just sends, if it's sending you a bad, uh, a bad state or maybe a, a, a start date for a batch, it will send you a byte sequence. You don't really know it's a date or it's a temperature or whatever the case may be. You need to have a way already of looking up that somewhere within uh, your network to say, okay, this is a, a date, so I need to represent it as such. So okay. with, uh, with the payload definition, so Sparkplug gives you that ability to kind of give your structure to your payload uh, in a way that is... Um, is understood by everyone else to say this is a metric, this is a, a a template which is a group like an object which is a group of, uh, of, uh, of of data points and so on and so forth. So these are kind of like the three things that Sparkplug adds on top of MQTT just by specifying how that should be implemented, which kind of like really makes it easy for systems that are particip participating on the same MQTT network to better anticipate and communicate with each other because with regular MQTT it's again also it's a it's a it's a wild wild west as it were right anyone can do it however they want to do it so it's different uh it's difficult to understand how someone is doing and this really it's a it's, a, it's sort of like a, a, a compromise that needs to be struck here because this still that 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 flexibility of mqt is what a lot of organizations find very powerful and they find the rigidity of Sparkplug really limiting in a way. So such that I've seen companies that implement Sparkplug at the SCADA level, just for the automatic discovery of devices and stuff like that. But as soon as that uh, 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 data leaves the SCADA layer, they convert it into regular MQTT so that it, it is easily consumable by even IT systems that don't understood, understand Sparkplug because Sparkplug use protobuf encoding, which really makes it difficult for everyone else to consume that information without knowing how Sparkplug works. So there's a, a balance there that needs to be struck. So, so from a plant manager perspective, because I think this is obviously too much detail for a plant manager, it would be, if I, if I am convinced that I need to uh, implement the unified namespace using MQTT, I would tell my IT team or the team that's actually implementing the group of engineers that uh, you must use Sparkplug as your as, as a guide. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So Sparkplug is that guide that kind of like really gives you uh, uh, that uh, recommendation of how you should structure. Your, it's rule, your, it's your, your, rules of engagement, right? Rules and right. engagement. So that other and what other other teams can play with the same rules. So that they can then yes. combine, right? A hundred percent, and maybe more, even more importantly for a plant manager, uh, the way to look at Sparkplug is that um, Sparkplug is mostly implemented using off-the-shelf uh, tools, right? And it's mostly about giving you the 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 ability to to automatically discover data points. So if you've got a new PLC that you are installing in your plant and that PLC is able to automatically say to the rest of the network, I've just joined, these are the metrics that I'm uh, going to be publishing in an instant. Typically, you'd have to go into the SCADA, put in the, the tags one by one. So if, you're, if I'm publishing say thousand tags, that needs to be manually configured in the SCADA system, right? You have to point to that, point to that, now imagine if that is happening in an instant, just yeah. by plugging it into a network and putting the broker IP address, all of that is, is, is immediately happening. That's kind of like really compelling for SCADA level of operation. Yeah, for sure. And that, and that, that will reflect significantly on the cost. A hundred percent. Yeah. So basically we're just kind of like going to, to, to just uh, um, breeze through this because it's kind of like really encapsulates what we've been talking about all along, whereby instead of having this spaghetti architecture that we saw earlier, now you've got all these um, systems pushing information from different angles, different directions, different domains into that central uh, unified namespace or central 
location. So it could be Spark Black or it could be flat MQTT. It doesn't really matter because the broker understands it as MQTT. You have to kind of like really know which information is coming from a Spark Black namespace, which information is coming from a regular MQTT namespace. Um, maybe not a bad idea just to kind of describe what is HiveMQ. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, now MQTT, as I mentioned, that it really uses a, an MQTT server or MQTT broker, which is kind of like the, the central piece that manages communication between different uh, components of an MQTT network. So HiveMQ is that MQTT platform that is not only a broker, by the way. So obviously, initially, IBMQ started as uh, offering like an MQTT broker, which is an um, enterprise broker. And the, the main difference, obviously, this is a common question. People come and say, maybe some have come across Mosquito and say, uh, I mean, do I need to 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 get a, a special kind of broker? Can I not do it with, MQ, with Mosquito? So the big difference here is like um, the enterprise uh, nature of the HiveMQ uh, MQTT broker uh, with things like um, uh, high availability, like with the the, the 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 scaling, automatic scaling. So if you are, I mean, for example, we have got, we, we do we deal a lot with the um, uh, automotive, also um, uh, manufacturing, and also even just connected cars. Where in most cases, really, the the loss of a single data point is a huge deal, right? And yep. not just automotive, right? Even a lot of manufacturing, critical manufacturing companies where the loss of a data point is really a big deal. So HiveMQ has got this technology that allows you to, that guarantees you that not even a single message is, is going to be lost because as soon as the message is, 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 arrives, is, arrives on the broker, it is replicated and persisted on the hard disk until it has been acknowledged that this is a, a message has been received successfully. So th this allows you, gives you that guarantee. And then also, uh, because it's it's a it's it's a it's a horizontal scalability. It allows you to have your broker instances. So it, basically, you've got say ten brokers that are clustered and they look as if one because they are also they're only just exposing one endpoint or one IP address. But in effect, there are ten brokers behind. So if one of them fails, you still have nine brokers that are uh, running. So there's no zero like guaranteed ninety nine percent. Uh, availability and again this can also be um, located in different geographies so for some reason if something goes on say in Germany and you still have some uh, uh, brokers still running in in the US so you still have you've got this high availability and guarantee okay. that so HiveMQ is an MQTT broker for enterprise grade uh, MQTT uh, deployments of course if you're doing a small PSC you can Use Mosquito, but again, also HiveMQ has got uh, HiveMQ Edge, which is like a small broker that is built for such uh, small uh, uh, use case or POCs, or, or maybe we're just trying things out. So basically, that is HiveMQ is based in Germany, and um, it was uh, started in 2012. Okay, so yeah. let, let, let me just describe the MQTT broker. Is just because you've got uh, a B in the logo, it's the Hive, right? Um, and you've got your MQT protocol as the, as the bees going out to go and fetch the pollen, the data. Um, and uh, everything is coming back into the hive, uh, and the broker is managing the requests respond, uh, the communication, if there's a break in communication. Um, and what you're saying is the differentiator with Hive MQ is that it's an enterprise grade. So you could have a, a multinational organization where you have a broker set up. Uh, in Germany, a broker set up in the, in the US, as you said, and if one broker in Germany goes down, for example, it can still function because you've got, let's say, a replicated broker in the US, uh, making it, uh, as you described, enterprise grade, not not for the little POC on the side kind of thing, if, if I understand correctly. Although you do have uh, an edge version uh, that can be used for POCs or small little projects, right? A hundred percent, and I mean, also, the high availability and also the scale of it. So we recently did a POC at HiveMQ where we demonstrated that you can actually connect up to 200 million uh, connections at, a, at any given wow. point. That is like massive scale wow. and not, not a lot of use cases actually, but that's just kind of like just to prove that point that this is this is how 
much you can connect to it. So which is obviously not able to achieve with small brokers. Some small brokers can connect up to 5,000 connections or yeah. 1,000, depending on the implementation, right? Yeah. Cool. So now how does the, the MQTT broker fit into the UNF, UNS uh, structure? So I think we've already spoken about how MQTT has got uh, topics that allow you to represent data or add context uh, to a certain uh, data point or a certain uh, object. So basically within your broker, this is how it would look like. So using an example there, let's say you've got a bottling company and then you've got Munich. Within Munich, you've got filling area. Within that filling area, you are, you've got an OEE calculation that is coming from an MES. So an MES system will be consuming data from uh, that specific uh, uh, area. So again, this is context for a data point. So an MS system already knows that uh, for me to get information to calculate OEE, I need to navigate to uh, Munich filling area, and then I'll get those data points, and then I'll do a calculation, and then I'll republish back the OEE into, into that specific uh, bucket of information for anyone else within the organization who's interested in getting that. So that okay. context within the hierarchy allows uh, semantic discovery of information. And of, of course, um, the unified namespace acknowledges another question that I get a lot is to say, so maybe a plant manager will say, but I've, all my PLCs, I've looked them the, 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 the documentation up, none of them talk MQTT. So does that mean unified namespace doesn't apply? So unified namespace really acknowledges the fact that we're dealing with the um, legacy uh, 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 equipment, right? Most of the uh, deployments out there still have a legacy equipment. So what you would have is that you, you would need to purchase or get a, 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 a gateway, whether it's software or hardware gateway, that is able to communicate using uh, those point-to-point, -point, whether it's mod bus or whatever communication that you are using, and do the translation to a protocol like MQTT, and then publish on behalf of those PLCs uh, uh, into the unified namespace or into the MQTT broker. And yeah. this this is a again I also got an, another uh, feedback to say, but this kind of like is a complex architecture. But the idea is that first of all acknowledge that fact. And then as you purchase new equipment, like latest information that, that, that talks MQTT, your architecture is going to become this perfect hub and spark model. So as fast as you can replace uh, old equipment, you can then start to get rid of those intermediary pieces of software or, or, or gateways that need to do the protocol translation. But the idea is not to disrupt the, because no one wants to go into code now and start changing. The yeah, idea is yeah. that you need to implement a data architecture without having to disrupt the existing uh, 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 deployment. So this allows you to do that and create that uh, interface. So basically, this is kind of like what it looks like uh, uh, in a in a hierarchical view of it inside a broker. Okay. So 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 if I can maybe describe that again from a plant manager's perspective, you obviously have an existing facility uh, and the idea is that let's define the, the future state of the, the, the data structure in the unified namespace. So let's work with the ideal state, the future state, and yes. how you integrate legacy machines is with these, let's call it little black boxes that unfortunately are going to be required uh, to translate the existing communication and data to talk to the ideal state unified namespace and then acknowledge that that's not ideal but it is what it is because from a future perspective when you buy new equipment you define that that new equipment talks MQTT in this unified namespace so you're defining that data structure rules of engagement up front so that in the future eventually those old legacy machines will die out and then you'll have new machines they'll be in this one standardized structure, if I'm understanding the point correctly. A hundred percent. It's really setting up the foundation uh, for scale and it's really setting up the foundation uh, for innovation, whereby you are, you are able to um, uh, continuously 
innovate on the same foundation. You don't need to recreate anything. So you, you get a new piece of equipment, you define the, the, the model of that equipment or whatever information you want to get out of it. And then you point it to the unified namespace and every other participant or any other uh, 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 entity or user who wants to build up on a data use case, they will immediately discover that piece of information and consume it and, and use it to uh, drive decisions, right? Without having to really go down to the machine itself. So it's really a building up on a foundation that allows you to uh, uh, gradually replace old technology with new technology. Yep. Makes sense. So now the uh, the other critical uh, piece of, uh, of of the puzzle that I need to address is the idea of um, unified namespace because in most cases people will say, okay, you've got an MQTT broker. Now, how do I, so I've got different systems that I need to get data off of. I've got some data in the SQL database. I've got some in the, in the CSV files. So not all information is necessarily coming from PLCs, right? So you still need to get that information out into the unified namespace. So that is why typically a unified namespace in, 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 in reality, it is a combination of two entities, an IIoT platform and an MQTT broker, right? So an IoT platform does the connection. So remember we spoke about how we are pushing domain ownership to the edge. So basically, typically you'd have an IoT platform say uh, in, in the plant floor, that IoT platform is responsible for gathering information from all these systems that a, for example, SQL database, you cannot connect, connect it directly to an MQTT broker, but there's certain interesting uh, data points that you want to get out of there. So maybe you want to add a historical context to say between uh, January and, and June, uh, we, we, we have got, we had so much uh, uh, maintenance incidences, right? And then that information is published into the unified namespace as the current state, right? And it makes it easy for some other component that is performing a maintenance activity to have that context without having to go to the SQL database directly and look for it. It's already available within the unified namespace. So the IoT platform allows you to perform that kind of interaction with, with these uh, systems, but you still have a situation where by say, a, using the same example, you have got a system that is using maintenance uh, information to perform real-time decisions. So maybe you still need to get more details that is not that has not been packaged into the unified namespace. You still have the ability to go around the unified namespace and connect directly to that SQL database and be able to query it, which is kind of like the transactional nature. So this is another misconception out there that the unified namespace is like a silver bullet. This is really not a silver bullet, and it's it's never been presented as such. But it's just that people who, or customers or whatever they when they pick up on a, on a password or maybe it's the marketing, it, it's presented as if this is the solution. This is the entire solution. Unified namespace is, is like an event hub. This is where you get all the current state of your business, but you still need to perform some transactions outside of it, right? Because it doesn't give you that ability to, uh, to, to directly go through a database and search through information. It's, it just gives you that snapshot. If you need, more information, you can reach out directly to that particular application. And if you, if the information that you were looking for that you couldn't find from the unified namespace, if you imagine that this would be of interest to like many other components, this is how it gets packaged up and then published into the unified namespace as a consumable. So yeah. unified namespace is a moving target. It's you're always pushing things to yeah. it, right? So you start by just pushing raw data, and then as you discover pieces of information that are of relevance to your entire organization, you start to package them up, connect to systems, push them up into the unified namespace. Yep. I think that's a very important point is that it's not a silver bullet and it was one of the points I was gonna bring up a little bit later in that we deal with a lot of uh, discrete manufacturing processes which requires transactional. You know, you spoke about earlier about batch size one. When I'm building a, a BMW axle and every axle is different, I have to make queries directly to databases to figure out what is the part number of this particular axle. And that's very transactional and time dependent. Um, 
within you know, 50 milliseconds, I need to do the transaction to the database and figure out what's going on, which is very different to what the unified namespace is trying to achieve. It's two different things. And I think it's about, at the end of the production process, how do I transform that data to sit in a unified namespace so multiple people can access the data retrospectively, maybe, and then do analytics and these other things. It's not necessarily, it, at least in the context I understand it, potentially, or it's not functional to make the machine work, if that makes sense. Yes, 100%. Well put there. So again, here quickly, uh, typically when you have got all of this information within the unified namespace, You've got normalized information, contextualized, and, and you've got all these um, uh, well-modeled objects. Now, because they, with the, within the unified namespace, you only get the current state, that snapshot. If you need to historize that information, you've got like a, histo a historian that can connect uh, either directly or through an IoT platform to the unified namespace, and then you historize all of that information, which makes it easy then now to go into a um, uh, give to data scientists, uh, for example, for uh, going through this information that has already been contextualized and normalized, which makes it easy to make sense uh, of the data. And also, if that information that, that is in the history is, uh, is given to the data scientists, they come up with insights, then they can push those insights back to the unified namespace to say, such and such an equipment is predicted to fail on such and such a date. So whoever is is what is, is whatever component is operating in real time has got context that such and such an event will occur in such and such a date. So this is kind of like how all these systems come into play. Okay, so something's confusing, a little bit confusing for me. Um, is unified namespace inside HiveMQ or is HiveMQ inside the unified namespace? Just looking at your graphic here. So HiveMQ technically holds the unified namespace. So yeah. the unified namespace is inside Hive MQ. Yeah. Right. That current state, that snapshot is within the MQTT broker itself because this is where all the information is retained. All the, the, the structure of the of, 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 of the information is retained, but it is produced outside of Hive MQ, so yep. that information is being pushed, say, by an IoT platform. So maybe, I, I, maybe I don't. I, maybe I think the the graphic maybe is a bit uh, 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 not not doesn't reflect that yep. clearly. But that's the idea that the unified names is is Hive MQ holds that snapshot. It holds yep. that picture. Okay. Okay. So maybe. This is also just kind of like to give you um, a reference architecture just to show how in a real world setup this kind of like uh, looks like. So typically you would have say, um, maybe you already have in your production environment, you already have uh, 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 connectivity uh, tools like Cap server that are already connected to your uh, systems and exposing that information either through OPC UA or MQTT. So if that information is being exposed through MQTT, which uh, Cap Server already uh, uh, allows you to do, that information is pushed to uh, an MQTT broker. So typically what you'd have is that for each site, you'd have uh, an MQTT broker. Now, again, this is not um, sort of like a, a fixed rule as it were. This is kind of like a guideline. So I've seen situations where, especially in the States, where you've got people who have got multiple brokers within a factory arranged many different ways. So this is kind of like just to give you an idea of how it would look like, but it is really up to the architect uh, how they're going to, 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 to structure that based on a lot of different factors. So this would like, you have a broker for each site, the broker, MQTT broker of the site is kind of like to create a unified, a local unified namespace and manage the coordination of information within that site. And you've got applications like CapSaver that are pushing MQTT but because Cape Server doesn't give you the ability to really contextualize the data, the flexibility to, to prepare your MQTT data, so that information is going to be published as it is, as a raw data into the, into the MQTT broker. And then you've got connectivity tools like HiveMQH, again, 
which allow you to connect to OPC UA, Modbus, and, MQT, and other MQTT because it's got a broker, and then push that information to the side broker. Now, because you've got raw data, it's not much of much use in the unified namespace if it's raw. The unified namespace is about contextualized information. So typically, you'd have an IoT platform subscribe to the same broker, get all of that information out, and then start to prepare it for consumption by other systems within that domain and outside of that domain in the business domain. Because if you send that uh, CAP server MQTT data up to business as it is, it's not going to be of much yeah. sense because it's, it doesn't really uh, make sense. And then it pushes yeah. same applies with different site. And then you could have then one central MQTT broker enterprise, perhaps in the cloud or in a data center that is being uh, 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 that is communicating with these uh, site level brokers and exchanging information to give a universal snapshot. Got it. Okay, and then maybe just quickly, this is kind of like really an example of what it would look like, say um, a unified namespace, that hierarchy of information where you've got um, uh, your, your, your packaging. So within an MQTT topic, you're able to uh, insert information so here, for example, within a particular cell, you can have MES information where you've got your quality information, maintenance, you've got the KPIs. And then from that, you, you've got OEE calculations, MTTR calculations, and then the ad hoc calculations that I mentioned that are specific to solving problems that are there. And the, these MES ERP namespaces, they don't necessarily need to live within a cell. It really depends on how your 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 organizations arranged. They could live within a line, and so on. So there's that flexibility. But the idea is that at the end of the day, what you end up with with the unified namespace, if this if this something that you can take away from this is that what what you end up with to your, to your point again of this golden roof houses is that what you end up with after implementing the unified namespace is you have got a platform for continuous innovation with data. You've set up this foundation. You've collected data out from all your different systems. You've contextualized it, and then you've put it into a central, freely and openly accessible uh, uh, hub where any participant that's going to come today, three years later or whenever, and they need data to make decisions, they simply need to plug in and then use that data to drive decisions. So you're, you're, you're building a platform for continuous innovation as opposed to just connecting application to application, right? So basically that's the that's the whole idea about the unified namespace. Hopefully it didn't go too into, sometimes it's kind of like difficult to really explain this with like a high level view, but yeah, yeah, hopefully yeah. it didn't really go into too much detail. It's a high enough level, but also some level of detail that I think is important, uh, like the, the semantic description is such an important thing. Um, if, a, uh, if a plant manager has to understand the details of their manufacturing process, I think it's now as important that they understand the data process as well. Um, the job is now different. If you're going to really use data to transform your manufacturing operations, that level of detail is important. Maybe the coding behind it is not that relevant to a plant manager, but you know, knowing that there's a, a semantic hierarchy and why that's important, uh, I think is critical. And I think that uh, was uh, fantastically exposed in your in your in the presentation. So um, the one question I was going to bring up before the presentation, I think we discussed it already about the unified namespace is not the silver bullet, and I think we've kind of addressed that already. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. And I think that's the. I never thought from an engineering perspective we would face the, the impact of social media and how people jump onto a seven second concept and they run with it uh, without understanding the details behind that. Um, and that's what happens. Uh, I think Walker's done a fantastic job in, ex in talking about unified namespaces. I mean, it's basically his concept, if I understand correctly. And, um, because he's, he puts it on social media, people take a, a snippet of it and they make their assumptions around that. And I think yourself and him and many others are doing a fantastic job to give the, the details behind that because I think that's, that's important. Um, Kudzai, I wanted to end off with a, a, a couple of questions around your personal life. Um, 
because I think that's also important, the, the man behind the technology, right? So uh, I saw you went to uh, University of Zimbabwe, right? Uh, National University of Science and Technology is in Bulawayo, yeah. Oh, in Bulawayo, okay. My mom was born in Bulawayo, by the way. Oh, wow, nice. Um, so maybe talk me through your journey from, um, from you know, school. How did you, like, get this desire to do electrical engineering at the at the university and then how did you progress to South Africa and then now you I know you're sitting in Munich somewhere oh yeah absolutely so yeah again so I was um born and raised in Blauayo Zimbabwe and then um I mean from like from an early age for me uh the fascination was around um robotics automation but it wasn't so clear to me at the start what what that really entails or uh what what you need to study study for that or where is that applicable or is it in manufacturing like just the fascination of of just of making things come to life in an automated way for me that was kind of like really the 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 um the attraction the, the attraction right so uh, and then went on to uh, study electronic engineering. So I actually studied electronic engineering at, um, uh, at the National University of Science and Technology in, um, in Zimbabwe. And then uh, the first um, uh, fascination or the, like the first draw towards that fascination of automation was embedded systems design, because this is kind of like really where I thought, okay, so this is really what it is about, right? So being like that, the programming, microcontrollers controlling some motors and this kind of stuff is really what i started off um uh, uh with in, in in the early stages and then i what what was uh, your first microcontroller that you so, made something move with so my MS first microcontroller was the uh so I, I was kind of like really programming um uh microchip pick pick oh, uh, microcontrollers well. yeah i think it was you this... programmed in assembler did you have to learn in assembler Yes, yes. So yeah. actually, I started. Actually, I was taught in assembly language, and then I taught myself C after uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, college, right? So um, I was taught assembly language, programming, a uh, peak microcontroller, 16, 16F877, like the 8 bit. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> 8 bit microcontrollers. I, I think I learned on the same one, I think. Oh, wow. Is it? Yeah, it was quite a popular uh, uh, microcontroller, that one. And and then I I I I I I went to Harare uh, in Zimbabwe still, and I think that was pro attachment like um uh, uh, internship in a way. Uh, and I remember I was like this professor was programming these microcontrollers, and he had this huge block of um, assembly code, right? And then already I had already started to program microcontrollers in C, and when I was when I was starting to build those uh, uh, my programming languages, like program those, those microcontroller programs in C, like everyone was just kind of like sh shocked that okay, so you could actually do this in like few lines of code because now everyone in the company was used to programming in assembly. Even the it, this kind of like really shows the the power of leadership because my sense is that. Um, uh, well, it was easier for the professor to 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 teach assembly, and and, and maybe because it seems to me that it, there was no encouragement for 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 students coming to learn there to understand that there is more efficient ways. Of course, it's, it's it's always good to appreciate the under underlying workings of things, right? But it's also important to to teach efficient ways of 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 of. Uh, of solving problems because honestly this is kind of like where the world is going if you if you if you can't come up with an efficient way of solving problem if you if you are not productive it doesn't matter how much skill you've got if you know the whole encyclopedia if you can't be productive as a as a human being you you, you can't be competitive right that's that's the that, that that's the thing so that kind of like really where i started doing it and started teaching within that um uh, 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 company, right? It was kind of like government uh, research center. So this okay. is my point is kind of like this is where my passion for teaching really started teaching these concepts because I just 
I was forced to teach other students that I was with at that time how to do it in C, how to use tools and and, and program better. And then from there, I um, after graduation, I moved to South Africa. I was um, in the uh, Vet Porch Kruger Stop area. So there's a company there that I was uh, working for. And uh, they were in the gas detection uh, 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 company and they were saving the mining industry around that belt here, around Kruger Stop. And basically there we were kind of like building embedded uh, systems and we are connecting these embedded systems to software applications, getting the data out. And this is really where the spark of data, like using data to make decisions really was ignited uh, for me because I, and actually, because I didn't know anything else, it, it seemed obvious to me, right? Okay, so obviously okay. if you have got instruments that are deployed across, you'd want to know what was going on at such and such a time, what were the levels of carbon monoxide, this and that. So we're collecting this data as a value add and giving it back to the mining because the company was a subsidiary of a German company. The German company didn't provide that stuff. It's the, it's the, it's the value add that we created okay. within uh, that company and it turned out that it was really valuable as a for a company right to 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 provide those insights and work there and then i moved into industrial uh automation right and then when i moved into that industrial automation first of all it was the first nation right i mean just uh being inside a factory i think probably it was my first time inside a factory like well, I have been in, in a factory, but not immersed in it in a way that I was when I started doing it professionally, right? Where you kind of like really experience the awe of, 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 of things being made, right? In real time, see things moving here and there. So there was that phase where I was really fascinated by industrial automation. And that's kind of like really where it really, I thought to myself, okay, this is kind of like really where I need uh, to be that production environment. And then again, to my point, as I mentioned, as I started to really, become comfortable in the space, I started to see those uh, shortcomings, those um, opportunities. And then when I saw that lack of data integration, it was very obvious to me that this is was this was an um, industry that was ripe for change. Like change, it, I had no doubts whatsoever that change is coming in this space. Sorry, what kind of automation was it? So it was uh, mostly saving the, uh, the food industry so milling industry like and are also doing some um uh, chemicals industry uh paint manufacturing and uh, oil oil blending and uh also chemicals uh, uh, uh process industry so it was a bit of okay of everything but small company so i was actually working for a very small company uh, up to 22 uh, up to 22 distributor this is kind of like how i got exposed to up to 22 PLCs early on because that was kind of like my first uh, uh, job was for an up to 22 distributor, up to controls, uh, based out of uh, Bromov in Runbeck. So I was working there with uh, Mike Harrison. And this is kind of like really where I started to to, to learn more about um, uh, industrial automation. And the fortunate part was really that up to 22 is a... Um, it's a very innovative company when it comes to uh, industrial automation. They they were offering API access very early on. They integrated Node Red like wow. eons ago. They wow. adopted MQTT. And I, so first of all, for history purposes, they were kind of like the the one of the five companies that founded the OPC spec in the early nineties. Oh, and. They also were the first company to bring Ethernet to industry when everyone was still doing uh, two-hour serial. So they are a small company, family business, but they they are really highly innovative company. So that's kind of like really what exposed me to that IT OT integration early on, being able to uh, expose to technologies like MQTT, OPC UA, API integrations. And so we were using those tools, um, those PLCs for, for the integrations uh, within S South Africa, so and then I started to 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 um to learn more about. And in, in initially, I didn't know it as IoT. So like maybe yeah. IoT might have come across me some some somewhere somehow. But when I started to explore it more, and then I started to understand. Okay, so this is actually a thing, right? This is 
industrial IoT is kind of like something that is being, uh, it's a wave. So I think the German uh, uh, government coined Industry 4.0, that is 2012, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, so for me, that was kind of like three years later, where I was kind of like starting to understand that. And then I in investigated it some more. And then as I did that, try to understand, get information, this is where it dawned on me that this is something that not many people are aware of, not many people are looking at, not many people are creating content around. So that was also a way, as a way of solving that pain for me, I started to create content as a way of teaching myself, right? Teach by sharing. And then as I started to, to, to do that more and more, it turned out that I somehow had a knack for explaining these concepts and really resonated with a lot of engineers across the world. And then people started asking for more information about this and that. So this is where I kind of like doubled down on the uh, on the content creation side of it, right? And then eventually I left the um, company, but I was still doing some uh, consultancy uh, jobs here and there. But now I'm starting to focus more on um, uh, industrial IoT and the content creation side of things. And then um, uh, I, I met uh, Dominic from HiveMQ. We were connected on LinkedIn and we uh, I had him once on my podcast. And then from there, I started to create, um, because as I mentioned to you, I was already talking about MQTT, promoting it, talking about how it is kind of like the next uh, generation uh, 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 connectivity standard. And so obviously that naturally caught the eye of HiveMQ. And because I was already using HiveMQ, because HiveMQ, they, what they did well early on is that they put out these tutorials for MQTT, which was really easy for, for me to understand MQTT. And naturally I started using their brokers for my demonstrations. So, and then they asked me to then start creating, first of all, as a freelance, I worked for HiveMQ for about a year. And then eventually, um, they asked me to uh, join permanently. So I still run Industry 4 Auto TV, which is kind of my YouTube channel, media and education company. And then I'm still also part of HiveMQ. And this is basically how I ended up here in Germany. Um, that's fascinating. And I, and I, I echo your uh, skill in translating a complex uh, concept into ways that we can understand. I've learned from uh, for many of your, your videos, uh, both on YouTube and, and on LinkedIn, I think the most recent ones that are sparking a lot of uh, attention on LinkedIn around unified namespace, but I think that's really important that you, um, we have those conversations. Um, so yeah, fantastic. That's, that's, that's an amazing journey. Um, it just shows you that uh, if you identify your passion early on, let that drive you can take you anywhere, right? A hundred percent. hundred percent. It's really about identifying your passion early on. Yeah. And for you, and I, definitely for me, I feel like we've been lucky that there was something early on that drew us towards this space. I find a lot of young people, um, not only now, but even in the past, that were a little bit lost in the early years to figure out what they enjoy. And they often study something and then realize they, they actually enjoy something else once they get exposed. But I guess you and I were lucky that we were somehow exposed to this world of automation, moving things uh, early on, which, which was our guiding light, uh, I guess, at the end of the day. Well, I think we pretty much really uh, just covered much of the, uh, of the conversation around uh, the unified name space, but basically maybe as parting thoughts, what I would say is, is, is the, I can't stress enough the, uh, uh, important. So, I mean, again, I call it whatever name it doesn't need to be unified name space or whatever. I'm unemotional about it, but I can't stress enough the importance of having that platform for, for innovation, because I think this is where most miss the point, right? They don't get that this is a, you're effectively creating a platform that an, allows you to to innovate at a, at, at a rapid rate, which is kind of like really what you need to stay competitive uh, uh, in this uh, landscape, right? And I can stress enough the importance of setting that foundation first and getting it right, as opposed 
again, to your point, the uh, golden roof strategy of just connecting things and seeing things light up and then saying, oh, wow, we've, 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 we've got uh, some data coming through. So it really needs to be a well thought out data architecture that once done well, you just continuously innovate unhindered. So no golden roof on shaky foundations. Start at the unsexy, you know, sometimes unappreciated foundation, which is what you describe in your presentation, and then start to innovate because then it allows you to continuously innovate, not just innovate once. A hundred percent. Because I, I really appreciate your time, the effort you put into putting the presentation out there. Um, thank you very much. Please continue the amazing work that you do. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanesh. Thank you so much for the invite. It's really an honor for me to be here and uh, talk about this subject that I'm uh, passionate about. So anytime, it's a pleasure for me. Awesome.